Um, our next speaker is Professor Stephen Shalley. Um, Stephen is Emeritus Professor of Endocrinology at Christine Hospital in Manchester, a consultant endocrinologist. Um, I have to declare a personal interest here in that it was Stephen who diagnosed me many years ago. Without him, I may not be standing here now, and some of you may have varying opinions on that. As a classic case of being diagnosed with something, in my case, pituitary failure, without the underlying cause being found. How often have we heard that? Then came an inspired decision from my then consultant to change tack and send me to Stephen. Thankfully, he'd seen it all before and made a rapid diagnosis. For my own 20 years, he was my consultant, mentor, confident, and latterly, I like to think, friend. From anecdotal evidence, my own opinion is that not nearly enough investigation is carried out on the endocrine function of GH patients. Hopefully, Stephen's talk will set some of you to uh, well, nice to be with you, and uh, I understand how and why it's an emotional day for you. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to show you any slides, I've got a few prompts for myself. It's that I wanted to actually mention. And I, I guess the place to start is, uh, what is an endocrinologist? And uh, an endocrinologist is an individual that hopefully looks after patients with endocrine diseases, um, what is an endocrine disease? It's the disease of the endocrine glands. And um, what are the endocrine glands? They are ductless glands. So they are glands that secrete their products, which we call hormones, directly into the bloodstream. So instead of, I'll give you an example, but the sort of glands that we're talking about are the pituitary gland, the so-called master gland, which is sitting you took a line back through there and two lines there, right in the middle there, about the size of a small thumbnail, that would be the pituitary gland, so-called master gland. It isn't really the master gland because it takes orders from an area higher than itself, but nonetheless, let's keep it as the master gland. And then you have the thyroid gland in the neck, and then you have glands called parathyroid glands, which because of their name, they're glands situated around the thyroid gland and they control calcium balance in the body. And then you have adrenal glands, one on each side, crucial for life, which sit on top of the kidney. And then you have the gonads, testes in men and the ovaries in the female. And then you have the pancreas, which is a good example of a mixed gland because it's an endocrine gland because it produces insulin and glucagon which directly into the bloodstream, so it's endocrine, but it also has a duct through which it pours other products and the duct takes it somewhere else. And that's called exocrine. So that's what an endocrinologist does. Those are the endocrine glands and they're important. And iron overload states, and I say that because hemochromatosis is one, but I had an interest in late endocrine effects of cancer treatment. And another form that one sees is in genetic forms of hemoglobinopathy like thalassemia, where these are children born with a propensity, gross propensity for anemia, so they're in constant need of repeated blood transfusions. They get iron overload states and they get endocrine problems in the same way as patients with hemochromatosis. Too much iron being deposited in the endocrine glands. So, those glands that I mentioned to you, if you look in the literature, cases of hypothyroidism have been described due to this condition. Hypoparathyroidism have been described due to this condition. Effects on the adrenal directly have been described due to this condition, and there is iron deposited in the testes or the ovary directly. However, the big two in terms of frequency are diabetes mellitus, which is due to a combination of relative insulin resistance, so the actual action of the insulin made is impaired, and then at the same time, because of the iron deposition in the pancreas, the amount of insulin produced is reduced and therefore you have diabetes mellitus. And the other common endocrine problem is something called gonadotrophin deficiency, which brings us back to this master gland, the pituitary. So this master gland has two bits, 
the front bit called the anterior and the back bit called the posterior. And the front bit produces six hormones, two of which are called gonadotrophins. FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, they use the female gland for its nomenclature. So follicle stimulating hormone, FSH for short, and LH, luteinizing hormone. They're the two gonadotrophins. And they're responsible for driving either the ovary in the female to have your regular cycle to ovulate and so forth, being driven from the pituitary. And in the male, they drive the testes. FSH primarily being responsible for the fertility section of the testes and LH being responsible for driving testosterone production. So that's how it works. And you've got four other hormones in that anterior pituitary. <coughs> growth hormone, you can guess what growth hormone does, but it's also a hormone that's important in metabolic life in an adult as well as in a child for making a child grow. Prolactin, primarily responsible for breastfeeding. Then you have TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, controls the thyroid, and ACTH controls the adrenal gland. So you can now see why it's called the master gland and how critical it is. And one of the interesting, really interesting observations is you can have, again, all of those pituitary deficits, but the deficit selected out is gonadotrophin deficiency. And that's interesting because you know, you think, well, why? Why does it pick on that cluster of cells and it doesn't do that to necessarily to, with the same frequency to growth hormone or to the one that controlling the thyroid or the one controlling the adrenal? So those are the two commons, diabetes mellitus, gonadotrophin deficiency. What does the gonadotrophin deficiency give rise to? Well, it gives rise to hypogonadism and it's more frequent in males and females because of what you already heard, because the female is less prone to this complication because of menstruation and, and, and uh, pregnancies and so on. So it's a problem that's more frequently seen in the male. What does it do to the male? Clearly infertility, because you need the gonadotrophins to drive sperm production by the testes. And then because you reduce the production of testosterone by cells in the, in the testes, you get reduced libido, e erectile failure, and you get a number of other issues. So you get changes in body composition because a man needs testosterone for normal muscle in terms of his body composition and reduced fat. So now without testosterone, he'll have increased fat and reduced muscle, both mass, strength, power. And then you also, it was touched upon earlier, see osteoporosis. So it's not just women that are prone to osteoporosis, but a male who is hypogonadal is prone to osteoporosis. You won't know about osteoporosis. Osteoporosis has no symptom until you have a fracture. <clears throat> the way that it's diagnosed is with a scan, looking at your bone mineral density. So you can't walk around and go, I think I might have osteoporosis. <laughs> it's silent, truly silent, until you have a fracture. So a hypogonadal male, you're interested in treating not just because of the most obvious question about sexual function, but because of all those other important issues like fracture risk, like the body composition. And those body composition changes will predispose you to cardiovascular disease. Something like about 6% in surveys of patients with HH have gonadotrophin deficiency, to give you some sort of feeling, one in 20. And it's increased in the presence of those patients that have already have cirrhosis and diabetes mellitus. And as I mentioned, more likely male than female, but it can be seen in the female, and it may be reversible. And the reversibility may be related to the duration of iron overload and the extent. One of the nice things about endocrinology is actually that it's full, once you know what it is, of treatable conditions. And you'll notice most of what I've been talking about has been deficiencies. And for all these deficiencies, there's hormone replacement. So if you're hypothyroid, you can take thyroxine. If you're hypoadrenal, you can take glucocorticoid 
and mineral corticoid in the form of tablets. So there's medication. And exactly the same is true if you come to think of the gonadotrophin deficiency. So in those individuals, those men, you can give testosterone replacement. And testosterone replacement comes in the form of a gel, which can be put on the skin. It comes in the form of an injection, which can be taken every three months. And you can just check on the testosterone levels. And you can have an implant, a testosterone pellet, which may last for six months. So there's a multitude of different forms of replacement therapy. And you can see that irrespective of whether the individual is complaining about sexual dysfunction, the need for treatment is real. Now, of course, if you then think, well, what about fertility? The testosterone doesn't give back fertility. Remember I said the control mechanism was a little bit different there. So if this individual was interested in fertility, he'd need to have replacement gonadotrophin therapy. So you can give FSH and you can give LH by injection and you can produce fertility by replacing the missing gonadotrophins. That's obviously a more protracted form of treatment and that would only be used when you were thinking about the need for fertility. Otherwise, if, if you were just dealing with a testosterone deficiency, as I indicated, you've got multiple forms of testosterone replacement therapy. So it's, um, it's something that should always cross your mind when you see a patient from an endocrine perspective that comes to you with hypogonadism, so that's reduced gonadal function, and your first set of investigations should be testosterone measurement, and it's low, significantly low for the age group of the man. Your next investigation would be FSH and LH, very simple, single blood test, okay? And if the FSH and LH are high, that tells you that something wrong with the testes and you're not dealing with hemochromatosis as a possibility. But if the FSH and LH are low or normal, it tells you that the problem is in the head in the area of the pituitary. So it's really a simple basis. And you measure one other hormone, which I won't bore you with, called prolactin. And if the prolactin's normal, you're now dealing with isolated gonadotrophin deficiency. And it should cross your mind that one of the potent causes of isolated gonadotrophin deficiency is hemochromatosis. A diagnosis well worth making. So I don't think I want to say a lot more from the point of view of yeah. talking, if that's okay. All the others I've mentioned to you have treatments and as I say, one of the great blessings of endocrinology is treatment is available and it's beneficial. Thank you, Thank you. Stephen.